Welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Justin Blinko, and today we have Edmund John, CEO and founder of Flag Theory. Edmund, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Justin. Please tell us what is Flag Theory all about? Sure. So Flag Theory is a concept which has been around for a little over five decades now. Basically, it's a method for achieving more freedom, privacy, and wealth through establishing international flags in different jurisdictions to uh, achieve the A-formation goals. So uh, specifically what it means is setting up a passport and a citizenship in a country which you feel uh, treats you well and which uh, ideally doesn't have a worldwide tax obligation. Right now, there's only two countries that have mandated that their system, their citizens have a worldwide tax obligation. That is uh, the United States of America and Eritrea, uh, a small country in Africa with human rights violation. So <laughs> those are the two countries which, you know, if, if you are a citizen of either of those two countries, you do have an obligation to uh, report and file on your worldwide holdings of companies and stocks and bank accounts and many different things. If you're not a citizen of those two countries, then really uh, you have a s system where you're taxed on your residency. You know, it makes sense that where you're resident in a country, where you use the government services and where you participate in local affairs is, is where you should pay your taxes. Um, I think at least logically that makes sense. Um, and most countries agree with me as, as that's how they base their system of taxation. So uh, right. the first slide being citizenship, the second being residency. Where you're resident can oftentimes be very fluid. So if you're an Australian person who moves outside of Australia uh, after a certain period of time, and if you've left with the correct intent, uh, the ATO deems that you're no longer tax resident of Australia. And uh, living in that new country, uh, wherever it may be, you'll, you'll pay taxes there. Um, but countries around the world have very different levels of taxation, very different levels of freedom and prosperity and all types of different things. So what I posit and, and what flag theory posits is that you get to choose and pick and choose where you're treated well. Uh, and once you've established that residency in a, in a second jurisdiction, you can go and you can uh, set up a company in another jurisdiction, which really is becoming more and more powerful as the internet continues to become uh, ubiquitous in our lives and really is just an important means of commerce. You're able to set up a company many times that operates entirely on the internet. And in, the, in essence, uh, pick a jurisdiction which, which really treats you well for a company formation. So many different countries around the world compete for your business in terms of setting up a company there. Uh, likewise, the fourth flag, setting up a bank account, is oftentimes uh, a competitive industry where people are trying to win your business over. And it makes sense that you bank somewhere where it's private and where your money is safe and that has a good rating. The fifth flag is, is physical assets. Where are you holding land or gold and how do you find some more redundancy so you're moving outside of the banking system? Uh, and the sixth flag is digital security. Where are you storing your email servers, things to that nature? Uh, and the seventh flag is digital assets. Uh, and this is a flag that I've kind of created for things like Bitcoin, Dash, other cryptocurrencies that uh, allow for you to uh, store wealth and, and have it be stored in a private way. Um, so I feel like that's, that's an important flag as well. So that was a quick, brief overview. I'm happy to kind of dive more into those uh, as you've seen. Oh, yeah, let, let's swing back to there. First, I'd like to learn a little bit more about how you got into this and, and your starts in entrepreneurship. So I was uh, in the United States going to school to uh, be a lawyer. And so during that time, I was a real estate agent and a broker. And I really learned a lot about sales and learned a lot about uh, talking to people and, and how to perform legal transactions. They were not complicated legal transactions as a real estate broker, uh, but nonetheless, they, they were. Um, and I was on the path to become a lawyer. But during that time, I kind of got attracted to the idea of setting up a website and setting up some sort of income stream that was a business that could exist beyond me. So certainly if you're self-employed, if you're a professional uh, lawyer or professional CPA, you can make good money doing that. But in, in some ways, uh, you can't escape that business unless you start a firm and you start employing other people for you. You're directly trading time for money. So that, that business model, uh, if you can call it that, this didn't really appeal to me as much as, as starting a business would. And so I was looking around strategically, okay, where does my skill set lie and, and what type of business might I be able to start with with this uh, little bit of legal background that I have so far? And uh, I started a registered agency. So uh, every time you register a company, um, you don't necessarily register directly with the government. Normally, they have a concept of registered agents. And these are agents who provide a local address um, for the purpose of serving 
uh, a process uh, or receiving a service of process rather um, for the customers in which they are registered agent for. So basically we're setting up uh, LLCs and, and corporations in the United States. And then, uh, yeah, we, I had a business going where I could either continue uh, to go down the path of being a lawyer or I could focus um, you know, full time on this registered agency. And that's sort of what I decided to do. And I was able to have freedom of mobility at that point now that I'd started a business and kind of decided that, okay, well, let me see what else is out there in the world. I'd sort of gone on short trips outside of the U.S. as a tourist, but I'd never really actually lived in another country. So there's a whole story there to that. But long story short, you know, having moved abroad and having had the ability to move, I started migrating to countries and sort of learning more about what does it take to go and, and migrate to this country and, and be an entrepreneur there. So I uh, moved to Singapore and I uh, received an entrepreneur in Singapore and started up a different uh, tech startup in, in that country. Uh, it didn't work out in the end, but I learned a lot in that process. And uh, after that, moved to Thailand and uh, I started a company there and uh, received uh, an entrepreneur visa from, from the government there. And then after that, now I'm in Panama City, where I'm speaking to you today, and going through the same process. And during that time, uh, you know, doing it myself and also setting it up for other people, I learned a lot. And and uh, really, I see my goal in trying to help people with flight theory is presenting them with the options that are clear and transparent and honest, uh, because it's a very confusing industry almost by nature. I, I feel like there's there's room in the space for somebody which really just presents clear, transparent options. So that's what we do it. Uh, Passports.io and Incorporations.io and bank accounts.io is try to present a clear and concise and coherent comparison for, for the different options that you have for international immigration, international corporation, and uh, basically put all your global options in a list so you can you know click and filter and compare them and find out what's best for you. I've lived and worked in, in three continents and I've seen that, had that same experience of the first time you go through all of these processes of getting your, your residency, your employment visas, a, a driver's license, anything like that, it's really difficult. But then as you look back, you can help your friends through it and say, oh, it's just these five steps. You just have to do these in the right order and, you know, talk to this person at this office. But the, the first time when you've never done it before, it's intimidating and, and a bit scary. Yeah, and, and just so much paperwork. <laughs> so really, another major goal is... is by, from us is to try to eliminate the paperwork as much as possible and just make it a lot easier to do because um, yeah, sometimes you want to go through the process and learn everything and that's cool. There's definitely, uh, I have customers like that, but there's also other people that just want to get it done and they just say, well, just do it for me. What does it cost type of thing? And what we try to do is bring a marketplace of, of different providers around the world who provide these services and connect them to our clients in a clear and transparent manner. Yeah, that, that's basically um, our, our business model. Edmund, I know most people probably have seen the, the news headlines of record numbers of people renouncing their U.S. citizenship. And I think it's probably somewhat related to the flag theory and what you're helping people do. What trends do you see in, in your world of you know, lifestyle designers that want to be global citizens and, and maximize their, their lives? Oh, uh, sure. So, so I think kind of two questions there. I'll answer it as, you know, one, why do I think that Americans are expatriating number, record numbers? And the second being, you know, what, what type of trends do I see in, in uh, the industry? Is that, is that our right. fair? Yep, yep okay. exactly. Um, so I think that most of the time when Americans are renouncing, uh, and, and this, this can vary widely, there, there are uh, certain cases and everyone's obviously an individual, but I think that a lot of people that renounce are, uh, not necessarily doing it because they want to pay less money. They're just doing it because they don't want to file the paperwork and they don't want to have the mind share of, oh, if I open up this bank account, then I have to file an FBAR form and you know all types of different uh, filing requirements that are required to the IRS or the Treasury Department, specifically the penalties that are attached to getting them wrong, even accidentally, uh, are just quite draconian. You know, For instance, if you, yeah, I, I'll just kind of leave it at that, that if you screw it up, it's, it's sort of a large penalty and uh, not necessarily comparable to the to the crime, if you can call it that, that's been committed of living your life as an expat and, and kind of needing to have a local bank account or local company and uh, the information that's that's requested um, and, and you have to pay money to comply with um, is, I think, uh, is, a, is a lot for American expats. And, and they're sort of unique in the world in having to do that beyond, uh, say, Eritrean citizens, which are the other category uh, that, that have to do that. So hopefully um, 
that those laws would change in the future. But uh, I don't have much faith that they would because uh, expats in particular are sort of an underrepresented class of people. In fact, I'd say in many ways it's taxation without representation because there is no 51st state for expats, expatriates. Uh, it, it's you know, they're simply voters in the state in which they previously were resident in the U.S., and they don't have a collective voice to really have anything said or done. There's right. no constituency, uh, I would say. So uh, that's why I think that, that that problem kind of exists, and I think that why people get fed up with that, you know, you do have people who do it for a strategic reason. You know, I don't want to have a, a global tax obligation, and this is like the price tag that I'm looking at paying uh, if I stay in American versus not. There are some of those people, but... To be frank, the IRS makes it uh, quite difficult if you have a high net worth to expatriate. You, you'll face an exit tax if you're what's called a covered taxpayer. Uh, if your net worth is more than $2 million. I didn't get that exactly right, but the, there's nuanced details there that, that you can look at. Basically, if you are a high net worth individual, it won't be as simple as just renounce and then uh, the IRS is off your back. It's sort of much more nuanced than that. So, yeah, I think that most people do it because of, of the paperwork issue rather than they're saving themselves a lot of money, right. uh, which is not what the mass media would kind of lead you to believe uh, in, in, in this situation. Yeah, it's hard to demonize your hatred for paper, paperwork, but your hatred of paying your fair <laughs> share, that's that can easily make a, a good headline. That's a good headline. Exactly. Um, but, but beyond Americans and, and to be frank, uh, most of the clients that I work with are not American. Uh, just because they're they're much easier to to provide solutions for, and and typically um, the tax codes in which you're dealing with are uh, much more simple. You know, lots of times what they're looking for is the ability to uh, move to a place and become a resident, and then get on the path to citizenship in that country. So there are many countries around the world where you can get instant citizenship through investment. You know, places like the Caribbean. Uh, there's Grenada, Antigua, Saint Kitts and Nevis, Dominica. Um, and then in Europe, you have Malta, and uh, there's a few other countries that you could do it as well, Vanuatu. Uh, most of these countries require an investment of hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to receive an instant citizenship. Uh, however, there's countries where you can become a resident and then receive a path to citizenship. And that's sort of one that's uh, very attractive to an entrepreneur that's running an active business. You know, you could start a business in New Zealand, Singapore, many different countries around the world. Spain. And after only a few years of living in that country as a resident and then permanent resident, you can qualify for citizenship and you wouldn't have had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in a donation or an investment in real estate. You'll simply have started a business in that country and uh, grown the business and by nature of living there uh, and, and sort of integrating for, for a short time, maybe a couple of years, uh, you'll be eligible for a citizenship in that country. So that's something that's, that's kind of uh, an interesting uh, play because a lot of the clients that I work with are sort of part of this digital nomad trend where they do have this freedom of mobility and time and they're able to choose where they live. So why not live somewhere that, that gives you a valuable travel document and is very strategic to grow your business. So kind of making those, those that, that's a trend that I see in recent years is people are sort of increasingly interested in that option as well as the uh, citizenship by investment, which uh, is sort of a quicker timeline, but not as many people would qualify by, by bulk numbers. With getting second citizenships, what, what's the range of, of costs and time for people to invest to, to achieve that? Yeah, so it, it really depends if it's an instant citizenship program. So if it's a citizenship by investment program, a, a CIP, then it can be, you know, three to six months and, uh, you know, a few hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, however, the, the actual programs and the details vary very widely uh, between countries and not only between countries, but also within the individual programs within that country. So you know, I'll give you an example. Um in Antigua, uh, you can become you can become a citizen through investment, and you can do it in one of three paths. You can make a direct donation to the government, you can make an investment in real estate, or you can make an investment in business. And there's sort of a, a different range in, in value between those two, between those three options. So uh, the donation is is a couple hundred thousand. The real estate is is you know, around four hundred thousand, uh, with fees around five hundred thousand. For a business, it, it's it's a little bit over a million um, to become a citizen through investment in Antigua. Um, now, not every country is like that. And to further complicate it, uh, even within Antigua, there's many different properties. So let's say that you took the real estate option, uh, you'd have to find a developer who was building an approved project within that country. 
And uh, oftentimes these projects can can be very different in terms of management fees and the fee structure. And um, it can be sometimes be difficult to see where it's a good investment and where it's not. So that's where we see uh, we can add value is that actually comparing these programs in these countries side by side and kind of building a holistic plan for yourself. um, That that's that's kind of where we're helping. So I think it would help to take our audience through a an example just to give the the six or the the seven flags that you have a, a little more concrete idea. So if you if someone came to you and said they were between 25 and 35, think they have a, a good online business option, and want to internationalize themselves using this flag theory. What, what specifically would you recommend? Yeah, usually uh, people come to me with at least some idea of, of where they want to be a resident or mm-hmm. a citizen. Usually they've done they've done some research. And we have a lot of free tools to kind of make that available. Um, so I, I try not to suggest a specific option. I usually try to uh, give them all of their options and kind of help them uh, decide which one which one is best for them. But um, you know, if I wanted to take you through a, a specific process that maybe I've gone through. Uh, let's let's look at maybe Singapore as an example. Uh, Singapore is, is a really unique example because um, anytime you set up a company in Singapore, you're sort of eligible in many ways for work pass, whereas a lot of other countries, that's that's not possible. So anyone can set up a uh, an LLC in the U.S., but if you're uh, located in India and you set up an LLC in the U.S., uh, you're not going to be eligible for a visa to actually come and, and visit America. So unfortunately, that's that's not the case as it stands today. However, Singapore, uh, you would be able to sponsor yourself for a, a work pass, or if you wanted to have you know a quicker path to permanent residency or citizenship, you could go through the EntrePass program, which is the one that I went through. Uh, now, this has become much harder in, in recent years. Uh, you're required to have sort of some level of IP, and also it's encouraged that you have a uh, uh, term sheet or equity investment from a uh, venture capitalist and there's a couple other requirements that are met there but basically it's a matter of filing paperwork um, in advance and then uh, setting up a company capitalizing with 50,000 sing dollars and then and then moving there now other countries have sort of lower thresholds that you'd have to invest uh, Spain is one that's particularly interesting and, and and not a lot of money to invest there's others I mean it's just it varies widely and it would be uh, difficult to, for me to summarize all of them sure. but uh, you know uh, if you had another one that maybe you wanted me to talk about, be more than happy to. Panama is kind of interesting where I'm at today, uh, especially if you're a country from a friendly nations visa. Uh, there's uh, sort of around 40, I think it's 45, 44 countries that Panama shares a, uh, a special agreement with where if you migrate to Panama from one of these countries and you're a citizen of one of these countries, then basically what you're required to do is set up a bank account in Panama and prove that you're a person of means. So this means put around $5,000 in a bank account. And then from there, you get a health test in Panama. They make sure that, you know, you're not going to fall over the next day and die. Once you've gone through that process, you uh, can set up a company or buy real estate in the country and you become an instant permanent resident. And um, after a period of five years, you would be eligible to apply for citizenship as well. Uh, Not that you'd need to, you're not required to, but you would at least have the option anytime in your life from then on out to permanently reside in Panama or become a Panama citizen after a period of five years. So it gives people a better option. You know, we don't know what's going to happen in the world. It's, it's kind of a crazy world. So, you know, having a redundancy plan, having a, a plan B or a backup option, it's, I think, always prudent and makes a lot of sense. And uh, you can pick and choose very, very well, you know, which of these countries that you'd want to uh, to be a part of or, you know, based on what matters to you most. In starting up your business, and getting that going, how, how long have, have you had this business? Coming up on six years now. On six years. What do you uh, know now that you wish you'd known six years ago as you were getting it getting it all started? I think that the world has changed a lot uh, in, the, in the past six years even. Banking has become a lot less private and, and uh, ultimately there, there's going to be a much more fluid and, and easy transfer of information between uh, all of the countries of the world, especially through uh, automatic exchange of tax information. Um, So I guess there would be no way to predict the future, um, but I wish that, uh, I mean, if I had a crystal ball and I knew that when I was getting started, I think that that would have been useful to know because ultimately um, a a private type setup or something where you're trying to um, remain 100% secretive is not going to work in in this environment. And, And I'm sort of, have from the beginning planned along those lines and, and sort of 
uh, known that that was coming, but it's just more obvious now than ever. So you really need to have foresight and planning. You can't just be sitting at home and say, oh, well, I read online about a BVI company. That sounds like a really good idea. Let me do that. You, you have to plan out, think ahead. Okay, where am I going to be a resident? What are the tax laws like there? What are the laws around owning a foreign company in that jurisdiction? And uh, how does that apply to me? And unless you have that level of research and insight, it's kind of hard to do. So it's become much more complicated and, and complex, I think, in the industry. But I, I do still think that there's a tremendous opportunity to do it. In fact, probably more so now than ever, uh, simply because it's just become much harder to, to do something as innocuous as set up a bank account. Uh, it's, it's become really difficult and for some people, for some situations. So I guess if I knew that that was coming, uh, that would be that would be great. But I kind of suspected that it did. The writing was a little bit on the wall. A lot of what you do is help people maintain their privacy. It, it seems like the general public today, obviously I'm generalizing, doesn't really value privacy that much. There, there are a lot of people who think that Governments should have, have access to just about everything. Why do your clients take these actions to preserve their privacy? Well, I don't know if uh, that is one of our core value propositions. I mean, I think that people do care about privacy, but I'd say, you know, mostly. Mo all right. Let me let me answer your question more directly. Mostly people care about privacy because they don't want to put themselves at, at risk for a blackmail type situation or a frivolous lawsuit. That's the most common that I see. You know, if you're wanting to have a private legal entity registration, which you know you can do even in the U.S. There are certain states which uh, list you or don't list you as a director or shareholder of a, of a company. And if you pick a state where they uh, they don't list you, then obviously that can be advantageous uh, for, for the following reason. Let, let's do a hypothetical. You know, Justin is uh, at a party at my house. We're having a good time. We have some drinks and uh, Justin decides to drive home and uh I advise him not to. I say, hey, Justin, you know, do you want to do you want to crash here? He says, no, I'm fine. I got it. I got to wake up early tomorrow. I got to go to work. I'm not going to tell Justin not to not to not go. You know, it's, it's his free will in his life. He can he can do what he wants. So Justin leaves. He gets in the car and on the way home, he crashes into another car, which has a uh, a father driving and a baby in, in the passenger seat. And unfortunately, uh, the father dies and uh, the baby is left fatherless. And uh, now Justin is on the hook um, because he gets sued for the next 18 years of, of that child's uh, life. So you've got to pay for that in many ways. Uh, but Justin doesn't have any money, and I'm the, I'm the household owner. I'm the one who provided the alcohol, provided the place to drink, and didn't stop Justin before he got in that car and went off into the road. And uh, basically what the, what the litigant is going to do, what the uh, litigator will, will look for is – who has the assets? Who is worth going after with a lawsuit in this state, uh, in, in this case? And many times lawyers are working on contingency fees in this line of work, personal injury law, and uh, they are going to look at who has who has assets. So if they're doing a company search, which is one of the first things that they would do, uh, and they find that I have all these illegal entities registered under my name, then most likely I would have some uh, money or at least it's a hint or a trail that, that I would and, and they would pursue based on that, based on that knowledge that they gained from a from an asset search, which is commonly called. Whereas if I'd set up my companies either internationally or I'd set them up and register them privately, then there's a situation where very clearly night and day you can see in one case I would have been sued, in another case I wouldn't have been sued. And uh, however frivolous that lawsuit may have been or may have not, you know, it's obviously an anecdote. Uh, you can see quite clearly that, you know, being private does have its advantages. And we're not talking about being private for the purposes of, you know, evading tax or doing illegal, anything illegal. Uh, we're talking about something which is well within your right, which is ownership of a legal entity and choosing to place that legal entity in a jurisdiction which values privacy and, and allows you to remain private. And so uh, that that's one way in which people can enhance their privacy. And I think that, uh, they they value that and they do uh, come to us for for that purpose and they're not necessarily looking to do anything wrong they're looking to to maintain their privacy because it can be advantageous to do so you've started this uh what i call a, a web business a lot of people and, and many of our listeners either have or want to start a web business what what strategies are you finding that work for marketing how do you get the word out that you can solve problems for for people out there I guess more broadly, what I'd say to people who are interested in, in starting a web business is is test out your idea and test it out as quickly as possible. I see people kind of in their uh, own little world building 
these extravagant plans that they don't actually test with the real world. And I also see people that they want their idea to be secret as if they've stumbled upon something which is really valuable and, and, and they need to execute on it and only them. And it, it really that's put, coming from a place of greed and fear and uh, not coming from a place of abundance and growth. And when you go out and you actually talk to people and you talk to customers and you talk to advisors, you get valuable feedback on your idea. And uh, really the idea is, is not – what is most valuable what's most valuable is the execution and uh if you want an example of this i think one that's really good to look at is uh, rocket internet and the samwar brothers and these are these guys that aren't well known in the, in the domestic us but internationally they're just uh very famous in the startup world for for starting these clones of us companies so what they do is they take an established business model and they basically try to execute on it in different countries and they're very brutal in the, their approach they'll They'll hire a bunch of people and they'll pay, you know, 150 percent of the local salary, which is expected. And then they'll fire a mass of people, you know, either if the person's not performing or if that company breaks down. They're very much focused on the numbers and executions and being fastest to market. And I kind of admire that approach in many ways because I think that uh, they have uh, something which, which other people don't. And that's a willingness and an adventure to go into these emerging markets where other people aren't moving quick enough. So now the kind of the cliche hip thing to do is move to Silicon Valley and start a tech startup and uh, raise venture capital. But uh, these guys are doing it on a whole nother level. You know, you're thinking about starting one company in Silicon Valley, and that seems like a dream. These guys are starting 10 different companies this month. Nine of them will fail and one of them will succeed. And that's sort of their, their game. So not that everyone can do that. That's obviously something where you require a lot of resources to do that. But I think it highlights an interesting example is that the goals and the, um, you know, kind of the, uh, the container, if you will, that you set yourself, uh, you set for yourself, you'll kind of only grow into, into fitting that container. So Peter Thiel has, has kind of a famous quote where he says, okay, look at your goals for the next 10 years. What would it look like if you did that in the next six months? And what would you actually need in terms of resources and abilities in order to do that in the next six months. And I think that the goals in which we set for ourselves are kind of bound to what we think is possible. So, um, you know, if you think that you have a marketing issue, maybe you do, but maybe you should look at your business kind of in a whole, whole new light. What if you could just dramatically shift the growth or shift the opportunity there? And yeah, I, I hesitate to give advice. I usually try not to give advice to other entrepreneurs. I, I try to do it in a way where I kind of make their options available. I think asking the right questions is, is sometimes better than providing the answers kind of the Socratic method. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, that was a long answer to your question. What book do you recommend most? For people kind of just getting started, it's, it's a really old one, but a good one called Think and Grow Rich. I just think that this book really kind of highlights uh, the necessary psychological steps that you need to take to start a business. And I also love that it's just so old. It's kind of like the grandfather of self-help books. It's something that's not, uh, you know, very new. It's not going to be on the New York Times bestseller list, but it's something which, uh, I think has a very, it, it had a profound impact on me in terms of uh, my entrepreneurial journey and, and kind of thinking about the ways to start a business and build wealth. What tips, strategies, or techniques do you use to keep learning? Well, I, uh, I have a certain amount of time that I set aside each day to the goals that I want to do. And, and you know, one of them right now is learning a language, uh, learning another language. And, and then, uh, you know, uh, I also set aside a certain amount of time to, to read a book. And the way that I keep myself on those habits is, is actually a habit tracker, and I'll, I'll enter those in. I used to do it in a spreadsheet, and I felt like, A, that was very nerdy, and uh, B, no one else must ever do this. <laughs> so there, uh, anyway, I, I did find an app for it, and now it's on my phone, and that makes it a lot easier. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how basically I'm, I'm Is the app able called to Habit day. Tracker? Yes, it is, actually. Okay. So you've heard of it? <laughs> uh, no, I not I haven't. I think that's the name of it. Anyway, there's there's a red box and a green box, and you can uh, okay. you kind of say either, yes, I did this, or no, I didn't. It's, cool. it's, it's pretty useful. That sounds good. If you could write a tweet that would go surprisingly viral, what would that message be? What would it say? Well, it's funny. We talked about this before the call. I don't, I'm not sure if I, uh, I've written ever written a tweet that, that's gone viral. But, uh, uh, yeah, me I neither. T today in the, uh, in, in the mindset that I'm in, it's that daylight savings time should not exist. And uh, I just wrote an article on, on the rationale behind that. Uh, I just think that it's a I don't like um, constructs of history or of the past that stick around. And there's no logical reason for them to still exist. I think that really, as a society, we should be able to make decisions and move ahead. And oftentimes we kind of get stuck in 
okay, well, this is tradition, so this is how we should keep doing things. And when you really dig into it, if there's not more uh, logical basis beyond, well, we've always done it this way, then you probably shouldn't do it that way anymore because it probably doesn't make sense anymore. And we had a little mix-up this morning in uh, scheduling this interview because of daylight savings time. So, uh, yeah. Could you provide us your, your contact info, who should contact you, who you're looking for, and if you have any ask for our audience, anything they should look into or, or start thinking about? Uh, sure. Well, you can find me on my website, flagtheory.com. Um, that's where we write a lot of articles and have content. And then we also have a couple other sites that are just uh, free tools that you can look at, uh, incorporations.io and passports.io. So plural, uh, passports.io. And uh, yeah, those are the sites that we've got right now. We've got a few others that will be kicking out this year, but uh, that's where you can find me at the moment. And uh, uh, people that I'm looking to work with are, are mostly entrepreneurs. At, at any stage, uh, we're always willing to talk to entrepreneurs and see where we can help, if we can help. And uh, yeah, that, that's basically how we work. Excellent. Well, Edmund, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yes, thank you, Justin. Welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Justin Blinko, and today we have Edmund John, CEO and founder of Flag Theory. Edmund, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Justin. Please tell us what is Flag Theory all about? Sure. So Flag Theory is a concept which has been around for a little over five decades now. Basically, it's a method for achieving more freedom, privacy, and wealth through establishing international flags in different jurisdictions to uh, achieve the A-formation goals. So uh, specifically what it means is setting up a passport and a citizenship in a country which you feel uh, treats you well and which uh, ideally doesn't have a worldwide tax obligation. Right now, there's only two countries that have mandated that their system, their citizens have a worldwide tax obligation. That is uh, the United States of America and Eritrea, uh, a small country in Africa with human rights violation. So <laughs> those are the two countries which, you know, if, if you are a citizen of either of those two countries, you do have an obligation to uh, report and file on your worldwide holdings of companies and stocks and bank accounts and many different things. If you're not a citizen of those two countries, then really uh, you have a system where you're taxed on your residency. You know, it makes sense that where you're resident in a country, where you use the government services and where you participate in local affairs is, is where you should pay your taxes. Um, I think at least logically that makes sense. Um, and most countries agree with me as, as that's how they base their system of taxation. So uh, right. the first slide being citizenship, the second being residency. Where you're resident can oftentimes be very fluid. So if you're an Australian person who moves outside of Australia uh, after a certain period of time, and if you've left with the correct intent, uh, the ATO deems that you're no longer tax resident of Australia. And uh, living in that new country, uh, wherever it may be, you'll, you'll pay taxes there. Um, but countries around the world have very different levels of taxation, very different levels of freedom and prosperity and all types of different things. So what I posit and, and what flag theory posits is that you get to choose and pick and choose where you're treated well. Uh, and once you've established that residency in a, in a second jurisdiction, you can go and you can uh, set up a company in another jurisdiction, which really is becoming more and more powerful as the internet continues to become uh, ubiquitous in our lives and really is just an important means of commerce. You're able to set up a company many times that operates entirely on the internet. And in, the, in essence, uh, pick a jurisdiction which, which really treats you well for a company formation. So many different countries around the world compete for your business in terms of setting up a company there. Uh, likewise, the fourth flag, setting up a bank account, is oftentimes uh, a competitive industry where people are trying to win your business over. And it makes sense that you bank somewhere where it's private and where your money is safe and that has a good rating. The fifth flag is, is physical assets. Where are you holding land or gold and how do you find some more redundancy so you're moving outside of the banking system? Uh, and the sixth flag is digital security. Where are you storing your email servers, things to that nature? Uh, and the seventh flag is digital assets. Uh, and this is a flag that I've kind of created for things like Bitcoin, Dash, other cryptocurrencies that uh, allow for you to 
uh, store wealth and, and have it be stored in a private way. Um, so I feel like that's that's an important flag as well. So that was a quick brief overview. I'm happy to kind of dive more into those uh, as you've seen. Uh, yeah, let, let's swing back to there. First, I'd like to learn a little bit more about how you got into this and, and your starts in entrepreneurship. So I was uh, in the United States going to school to uh, be a lawyer. And so during that time, I was a real estate agent and a broker. And I really learned a lot about sales and learned a lot about uh, talking to people and, and how to perform legal transactions. They were not complicated legal transactions as a real estate broker, uh, but nonetheless, they, they were. Um, and I was on the path to become a lawyer. But during that time, I kind of got attracted to the idea of setting up a website and setting up some sort of income stream that was a business that could exist beyond me. So certainly if you're self-employed, if you're a professional uh, lawyer or professional CPA, you can make good money doing that. But in, in some ways, uh, you can't escape that business unless you start a firm and you start employing other people for you. You're directly trading time for money. So that that business model, uh, if you can call it that, just didn't really appeal to me as much as, as starting a business would. And so I was looking around strategically, okay, where does my skill set lie and, and what type of business might I be able to start with with this uh, little bit of legal background that I have so far? And uh, I started a registered agency. So uh, every time you register a company, um, you don't necessarily register directly with the government. Normally, they have a concept of registered agents. And these are agents who provide a local address um, for the purpose of serving uh, a process uh, or receiving a service of process, rather, um, for the customers in which they are registered agent for. So basically, we're setting up uh, LLCs and, and corporations in the United States. And then, uh, yeah, we, I had a business going where I could either continue uh, to go down the path of being a lawyer or I could focus, um, you know, full time on this registered agency. And that's sort of what I decided to do. And I was able to have freedom of mobility at that point now that I'd started a business and kind of decided that, okay, well, let me see what else is out there in the world. I'd sort of gone on short trips outside of the U.S. as a tourist, but I'd never really actually lived in another country. So there's a whole story there to that. But long story short, you know, having moved abroad and having had the ability to move, I started migrating to countries and sort of learning more about what does it take to go and, and migrate to this country and, and be an entrepreneur there. So I uh, moved to Singapore and I uh, received an entrepreneur in Singapore and started up a different uh, tech startup in, in that country. Uh, it didn't work out in the end, but I learned a lot in that process. And uh, after that, moved to Thailand and uh, I started a company there and uh, received uh, an entrepreneur visa from, from the government there. And then after that, now I'm in Panama City where I'm speaking to you today and I'm going through the same process. And during that time, uh, you know, doing it myself and also setting it up for other people, I learned a lot. And, and uh, really, I see my goal in trying to help people with flight theory is presenting them with the options that are clear and transparent and honest uh, because it's a very confusing industry almost by nature. I feel like there's there's room in the space for somebody which really just presents clear, transparent options. So that's what we do at uh, Passports.io and Incorporations.io and Bank Accounts.io is try to present a clear and concise and coherent comparison for, for the different options that you have for international immigration, international corporation, and uh, basically put all your global options in a list so you can, you know, click and filter and compare them and find out what's best for you. I've lived and worked in, in three continents and I've seen that, had that same experience of the first time you go through all of these processes of getting your, your residency, your employment visas, a, a driver's license, anything like that, it's really difficult. But then as you look back, you can help your friends through it and say, oh, it's just these five steps. You just have to do these in the right order and, you know, talk to this person at this office. But the, the first time when you've never done it before, it's intimidating and, and a bit scary. Yeah, and, and just so much paperwork. <laughs> so really, another major goal is, is by, from us is to try to eliminate the paperwork as much as possible and just make it a lot easier to do because, um, yeah, sometimes you want to go through the process and learn everything, and that's cool. There's definitely, uh, I have customers like that, but there's also other people that just want to get it done, and they just say, well, just do it for me. What does it cost type of thing? And what we try to do is bring a marketplace of, of different providers around the world who provide these services and connect them to our clients in a clear and transparent manner. Yeah, that, that's basically um, our, our business model. Edmund, I know most people probably have seen the, the news headlines of record numbers of people renouncing their U.S. citizenship. And I think it's probably somewhat related to the flag theory and what you're helping people do. What trends do you see in, in your world of you know, lifestyle designers that want to be global citizens and, and maximize their, their lives? 
Oh, uh, sure. So, so I think kind of two questions there. I'll answer it as, you know, one, why do I think that Americans are expatriating number record numbers? And the second being, you know, what, what type of trends do I see in, in uh, the industry? Is that, is that our right. fair? Yep, yep okay. exactly. Um, so I think that most of the time when Americans are renouncing, uh, and, and this, this can vary widely, there, there are uh, certain cases and everyone's obviously an individual, but I think that a lot of people that renounce are uh, not necessarily doing it because they want to pay less money. They're just doing it because they don't want to file the paperwork and they don't want to have the mind share of, oh, if I open up this bank account, then I have to file an FBAR form and you know all types of different uh, filing requirements that are required to the IRS or the Treasury Department specifically the penalties that are attached